We have today a number of questions that I'd like to try to address. And I'll admit at the outset that they come from more than one of the participants, but I felt that there were some important common themes to all of these questions, and it would be most effective and instructive for us to discuss them together. So with that, we begin with the first of these questions. You have often stressed that Torah means instruction or teaching, and that the Bible teaches us how to live our lives rather than about science or history. But if the Bible stories are true, don't we also learn from them about nature and about history? So before we continue with the balance of the questions, I'd like to address this one because it really is the encapsulation of the essential foundations that I feel we need to discuss. And of course, like any good question, the way it's formulated contains within it the seeds of the answer. That is, on the one hand, as we have indeed noted on many occasions, despite the fact that Torah is typically, in most translations, rendered as law, law is not what the word Torah means. There are a number of words in Hebrew that mean law, justice. Torah is not one of them. Torah does indeed mean teaching or instruction. For the Hebrew experts among you, you will undoubtedly immediately discern that the root of Torah is the same as the words more and mora, which mean teacher, hora'a, which means instruction. And of course, once we appreciate that the role of Torah is that, rather than only war, if anything, it sharpens the question. Because after all, if the Torah were merely a book of laws, then we would appreciate that anything that doesn't pertain to strict legality is irrelevant, and that would clearly include nature and history. But since Torah means teaching, and of course we readily appreciate when one considers the content of the Torah, that it's not just about laws, there are stories, there are various additional dimensions that are conveyed to us that are not merely legal. Well, if we take it all seriously, aren't we also learning science and history from the Torah? And inevitably, the answer here is nuanced. Because on the one hand, obviously, the Torah is conveying to us events that necessarily incorporate within them aspects of nature and history. But the agenda of the Torah, It begins 
with our saying to God, the opening blessing. Blessed are you, God. Our God and God of our forefathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. And of course, immediately, I think we could all sense what you hear reverberating in those words is God of history. That opening blessing addresses God within a context, and that context is history, because we perceive God manifest to us through what takes place in history. And that's the first blessing. The second blessing speaks of God as the one who causes the wind to blow and the rain to fall. God, sovereign over nature by having created nature and capable of overriding nature, since he is the sovereign of nature in reviving the dead, in doing miracles in nature. So that second blessing is about God in nature. God's hand is manifest in history and in nature. And that, more than anything else, is the message that the Bible is all about. This all is what I'll broadly describe as one side of the issue. That one side of the issue stresses in the strongest of terms that were we to conceive of God as existing all right, but existing out there in some other realm that is irrelevant to us, that would be heresy. It is critical from our perspective. And this is, I'll argue, the essential message of the Bible. That God isn't merely out there, that God is in here, and that we do perceive God manifest in history and in nature. Uh, but again, I'm going to stress, that's one side of the coin. There's another. In the third blessing, in this core essential prayer that we say to God, over and over again, at least three times a day. The third blessing speaks of God as holy, exalted, even transcendent. Inevitably, we sense there's a tension here. On the one hand, to conceive of God as divorced from, indifferent to, disinterested in this world, is from our perspective, Again, a heresy. On the other hand, to think of God as actually subsumed within this concrete physical world in which we live is also a heresy. Because, of course, God is so far beyond that. And there's a tension here. The tension between 
on the one hand, appreciating the message of the Bible, the essence of the Bible, is that God is involved, that God is manifest in nature and in history. But simultaneously, on the other hand, to not get so caught up in nature and history that we actually make nature and history into the be-all and the end-all of our existence. Because God transcends. And furthermore, when we speak of nature and history, the significance of nature and history lies exclusively in their serving as the stage through which we perceive God manifest to us. If we were to conceive of nature and history as the be-all and end-all of existence, then inevitably we would be thinking of the science, the history, as the essence in the Bible. And here, again, I'm going to stress unequivocally it's not. That is. Returning to question number one with which we began, if the Bible stories are true, don't we also learn from them about nature and about history? And the answer, we may. After all, if God is manifest to us through nature and history, then when we read about God being manifest, we're going to be reading about nature and history through which he's manifest. So we may learn about nature and history, but it's always important for us to bear in mind that's not the Bible's focus because of its teaching, instruction. It's teaching us first and foremost how to live. And as a necessary component in teaching us how to live, cultivating an attitude with respect to living an attitude with respect to spiritual living. Indeed, perceiving God's hand all the time in our lives. So yes, we may be learning about nature, we may be learning about history, but it's important, of course, for us to bear in mind that caveat. Now, having stated this, there is, of course, an additional dimension that it is critical for me to stress here, because we're not really talking about some kind of technicality. Namely, when we recognize that what the Bible is about is teaching us, communicating to us these essential truths, and the truths about science and about history, well, they're just not the focus. We also recognize Certainly with respect to such issues as scientific fact, we diverge greatly from earlier generations. Now, that's true, of course. But if you ask, how then can the Bible communicate with us all? My response very simply is, the truths that the Bible is committed to teaching us are truths that are indeed common for all of us, for all of humanity. Obviously, to that extent, the truths that the Bible conveys to us about moral living, about right and wrong, about living in the presence of God, about actualizing ourselves spiritually, those truths don't depend upon some particular set of data pertaining to science, or pertaining to history. So, 
we obviously aren't going to expect the Bible to dwell upon those data of science and of history. That's not the focus. The focus is on the truths of the Bible, those truths that are conveyed to us. So, inevitably, that has a number of implications. Number one, we're not going to expect the Bible to be teaching us modern science, because obviously what's modern science for us is very different from what was viewed as scientific fact just a few generations ago. And it would be a hopeless endeavor to convey to us the essential truths of the Bible were they to be utterly obscured and confused with all sorts of detail that really is only of peripheral relevance pertaining to the technicalities of science and history. So the Bible inevitably doesn't address those. It speaks on a different plane. I'll add an additional nuance here, and this is maybe a controversial observation, although I think it's a compelling one. And that is that when we read in the prophets the allegories, the descriptions, the manner in which the prophets describe this world and the way things operate in this world. We, of course, encounter statements that are glaring to us, grating to us, because they don't jive with our understanding of science. Well, inevitably, we need to ask ourselves, not only what were the truths that the prophet was striving to convey to us, but moreover, what were the truths that God was intent upon conveying to the prophet? That is, to the extent that the prophet asks a question, God's answer is always true. But to the extent that the prophet, like in various ways, all of us, has a set of assumptions about the way the world operates, doesn't ask about them because it's not relevant to ask about them, to that extent, there's no reason that we should expect God to be clarifying answers to questions that were never asked, that would never have been dreamt of. So again, returning to the essential point, don't we also learn from these stories about nature and about history? We may, incidentally, but that's not what they're there to teach us. They're there to teach us about God, and they're there to teach us about our own lives and how to live them out in God's presence. Now, I realize I've been speaking in very abstract terms, so let's get a bit more concrete to illustrate what this means in practice. I'll first use an example, admittedly, an example that I shared with you some time ago in our studies of the five books of Moses. At the very beginning of the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 1, verse 1, God spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai at the tent of meeting on the first of the second month of the second year of the Exodus. So we have a date, the first of the second month. Now that's, again, Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. So we proceed through the book of Numbers until we get all the way to chapter 9. We have advanced eight chapters in the interim. Well, having advanced eight chapters in the interim, how much time do you think would have elapsed during this period? And we get to the beginning of chapter 9, and we read, God spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the second year of the Exodus, 
in the first month. In the first month. But chapter one was already in the second month. So over the course of eight chapters, we went back a month. What's going on? Well, our answer to this question, a well-enshrined principle in the Jewish tradition of biblical scholarship is in the Hebrew, Ein Mukdam Um Uchar Batorah translation. Literally, there is no before or after in the Torah. Now, we need to clarify what that means. Obviously, it doesn't mean that the Torah is a hodgepodge of different stories that are thrown together at random without any structure. On the contrary, there certainly is a structure. For the most part, mind you, the structure is chronological, but it isn't necessarily. And the reason it isn't necessarily is certainly not because the Torah is haphazardly arranged, but rather because the agenda of the Torah, once again, is teaching, instruction, not history. So necessarily, the chronological ordering of the events in the Torah must be subordinated to something of greater significance. And that is the teachings of the Torah. To share with you another interesting example, and I have to concede that we can go on and on with examples of this sort. I'm not going to because they're just simply legion. There are just so many of them. At the end of Genesis chapter 11, we read, the days of Terach were 205 years, and Terach died in Haran. So we read the end of the life of Terach, father of Abraham, when he was 205 years old. Let's do some basic arithmetic here. We read a few verses earlier in chapter 11, verse 26, that Terach was 70 years old when he begot Abraham. Now, by simple arithmetic, then, that means that at the time of Terach's death, Abraham was 135 years old. Of course, 205 minus 70. When Abraham was 135 years old, he had already begotten Ishmael, Isaac. Practically all of the events of the coming chapters had already taken place. That is, when all said and done, Abraham lived to the age of 175, but that means that everything other than the last 40 years of his life took place before the death of Terach. And again, we would ask why the exchange of the order of events, why the anachronistic statement that describes Terach dying so many years before he actually did. And again, inevitably, the answer will lie in the lessons, the teachings that the Torah wishes to convey. In this context, perhaps, that when someone is far from God, then even if he's alive, we relate to him as dead. So Terach is just not going to be part of the picture. There may be other lessons as well. We could speak at length of why the order of the Torah is what it is. But in responding to this question, what is, of course, of greatest importance is that we appreciate that that is the agenda of the Torah. Chronology may be there at times, but it's definitely never going to be the priority. So again, this illustrates that one principle in the Jewish tradition of biblical scholarship, that there is no before and after in the Torah. I'd like to share with you an additional one 
And it is also, likewise, a core principle that the Torah speaks as the language of people. Now, what does that mean, the Torah speaks as the language of people? To give you some obvious examples, we read regarding the exodus from Egypt that God brought us forth from the land of Egypt in the Hebrew, biyad chazakau bizronatuyah, with mighty hand and outstretched arm, a formulation that we encounter in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 34, and elsewhere. So, are we to conclude that God, in any literal sense, has hand or arm? Or, for that matter, when we read in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 12, of God's looking after the land of Israel. So this is a land that God your Lord inquires after. Always the eyes of God your Lord are upon it from year's beginning to year's end. Eyes of God? What does that mean? That God has actual physical eyes? And of course you can readily appreciate, I think this is a fairly self-evident answer, that we do not posit that God has a physical arm. We don't posit that God has physical eyes. In fact, we don't posit any sort of physicality at all. All of these expressions, which we would describe broadly as anthropomorphisms, speaking of God in the language of people, are expressions that we use because the Torah speaks as the language of people. And inevitably then, we need to appreciate, you know, an answer to that essential question, if the teachings of the Torah are true, then what are we going to learn from them? We'll learn from them about the manner in which God is revealed to us in this world. We're not going to learn from them the lessons that would necessarily emerge if we presumed that everything in the Bible is to be taken in a simplistic, literal manner. Things are more complex than that. Things are more nuanced than that. And the consequence then, it is on this note that I'd like to conclude our discussion of question number one. That is, we definitely believe the Bible's stories are true because they are teaching God's truths that are revealed to the world. But as for whether those truths translate into any sort of information about nature or about history, the only answer that we can state is it depends. It depends on the specific example. It may also very well depend upon the different views of different scholars. But it depends, most essentially, because regardless, that's not the essence. The essence is the teaching, the teaching of God's truths that guide us and continue to lead us in our lives in this world. That, after all, is precisely, exactly what Torah always is all about. And I hope on that note, we have at the very least provided something of an overview of responding to question number one.